I think you're on mute there, Melinda. Ah, what do you think of my hat, Conrad? It's fantastic. <laughs> it's spooky season. It is. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. I know that you guys don't do Halloween that much over there, so I wanted to, you know, give me the give full you the experience, full trick or treat experience. So I I brought up my trick or treat bowl that I have out for the little kids that I hand out candy on Halloween night. It's got a ceramic <laughs> hand in there, and so the really little kids freak out. <laughs> 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 they freak out when they put their little grubby hands in here and, and I just well, cackle at them. <laughs> that's what they deserve. They want free That's what candy. they deserve. That's right. <laughs> it's called trick or treat, but in this case it's tricks and treats. So I'm doing the tricks and they get the treats. It's a trade-off really. Yeah, that sounds great. I'd be tempted <laughs> to lube up the hand, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> put a joy buzzer in there maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just really freak them out that would be great <laughs> so this has got like this little bat bow on it and it's i don't know it feels kind of professor mcgonagall kind of like it's bigger and floppier it's really enormous and crazy like you know yeah, you yeah, gotta do it's it got, it's got the tim burton curl in there it's great i know i Etsy, you guys, like, don't go Amazon. <laughs> you got to go Etsy for the nice witch hat. So, yeah, it's true. <laughs> so, you've got some spooky stuff going on there. You've got a glowing jack o' lantern behind you. I yeah, love it. Yep. Try to get into the mood. And also, I didn't dust this week. So, this is sort of <laughs> just natural. Nice. Yeah, it's gorgeous. There somewhere. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's so, I have to tell you this story. My good friend Scott Hughes sent me this hot sauce. It's called Halloween hot sauce. And it came like in the mail yesterday. And I finally got around to opening it today. Open this box. It's just like a standard shipping box. And inside, right at the very top, I guess the company that he ordered it from had put like fake bugs like a oh. fake cockroach and a fake spider. But I saw the cockroach first and I'm telling you, <laughs> I jumped back and screamed because <laughs> I really thought it was a real cockroach. Scared the crap out of me. So thanks yeah, a lot, Scott. That's not the desired response the company wanted, I don't think. <laughs> and then I, so I, I, I gotta say, I threw the cockroach thing away because it was so realistic and gross. And there was a spider and a little baby snake. And I set them up onto the countertop right by Michael's keys and stuff. So when he went to leave this morning, because he was going out, he freaked out because he saw the spider. <laughs> <laughs> so you got us both, Scott. Well done. <laughs> so, oh. yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, welcome to Dreamland, everybody. Uh, we're happy to be celebrating Halloween season with you all today. Um, as always, we posted our uh, one word clue online for this this week or this month rather and asked people to guess the topic for today. So um, this was our, our lovely image that we posted filled with some clues. Lots of people got it right this time because I mean, it wasn't that hard to guess. So no. uh, we had K Dog <laughs> Broadcasting uh, said the history of our beloved snack cake youth. Oh, by the way, that the word was hostess. So uh, the the history of our beloved snack cake youth, the wonder of the fruit pies, and the burning question to skewer hostess: What did you do with the tiger tail? So that's probably not making a lot of sense to you, Conrad, because you guys probably don't have hostess cakes over there. But over here uh it's it's a thing right <laughs> so <laughs> matthew poe says hosts of horror movies that aired on tv in the 80s joe bob briggs was on tnt monster vision so he was pretty darn close mm -hmm. and then tim hayes uh our longtime supporter says horror movie hostess with the mostest elvira or vampira nailed it didn't just say elvira lots of people guessed elvira because she's the most well-known of the two lovely ladies we'll be discussing today because our topic this month is of course vampira versus elvira 
horror host history. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit uh, about Conrad up a little bit and you down a little bit. Okay, uh -huh. so did you hear that, Conrad? Just a for you down, Conrad up a little bit. I, I'm bumping down and you're bumping up, Conrad, if you can. Uh -huh. I will do my best. Okay, just yell. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to remove my witch hat now, guys, because I want you guys to take me seriously as I start talking about this very important topic. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, um, I grew up with uh, horror TV shows on these hosted shows. Uh, Joe Bob Briggs' Monster Vision was also something that I watched constantly along with, uh, of course, Mystery Science Theater technically is one of these types of shows with a with a host, and then they show like a cheesy B movie that they can get pretty cheaply without having to pay any kind of major royalties for. And so it's wonderful for filler, like for for stations who need, you know, round the clock programming, which started becoming a thing even more like in the mid to late '80s. So we saw a lot of these becoming big on cable networks, but uh, initially, of course, they started out on like local stations and things like that. Um, I don't know that they had a lot of this over in the UK, Conrad. What What do you think? No, I mean, uh, other uh, Brits watching might be able to uh, correct me on this, but me growing up, I never saw anything like this. Um, the closest that I could think of from my own childhood was we had a show called Tales of the Unexpected, which I know there was a US show called that too, but this was very much based on the short stories of Roald Dahl, the primarily known as a children's author now. And mm -hmm. he used to do introductions for his short stories for like the first and second seasons. But then in the third season, they started doing other people's stories. So he kind of disappeared. But that's more like Rod Serling in the Twilight Zone. That's not really the same sort of phenomenon. Yeah. So we're, we're, was this a show where they were kind of creating new content to yeah. to make little stories? So yeah, that's and it's sort of similar in terms of the format where you have a host and then it cuts to a different little short movie or whatever. But yeah. it is sort of a different like concept, like on the back end, like in terms of production and things like that, I think. Yeah. So um, I wanted to just sort of show through the years kind of some of the bigger uh, examples of this. So this really started in the 50s, as we will be talking about shortly uh, with the main focus, the first main focus. But there were a number of other horror hosts that came about around 1957. And I think you're going to talk a little bit more later about why that happened. But there was like the universal monsters, like the, the movies that were made about them were released as like a whole set of films that were able to be shown uh, starting in 19, I think it was 57. And so you see all of these little local shows. Uh, so we have Tarantula Ghoul in Portland, uh, Morgus the Magnificent in Louisiana, and Zachary the Cool Ghoul in Philadelphia, all in about 1957-58, and then Gorgon in Texas. So, I mean, you've got a whole bunch of different kinds of uh, content there. Same concept, right? And then mm. it continues on into the 60s. Uh, you've got the Vegas Vampire, Chili Billy, Moona Lisa, <laughs> <laughs> which is more of like a science fiction. So she's kind of more on the mystery science theater thing, right? So she's not yeah. just horror. Uh, and then Bob Wilkins. Um, so some of these guys look very tame and very nerdy 60s. Uh, and some of them look really cheesy, but it's great. We move into the <laughs> 70s and get people like Sven Gulli, Sammy Terry, who our, our moderator, Tim Ward, was like, you got to include Sammy Terry because, you know, he's from Indianapolis. And so he grew up with this guy and he said it scared the crap out of me and i watched him all the time as a kid so <laughs> um count gordeval and sinister seymour uh all in different cities throughout the united states um and then of course once we move into the 80s you had things like freddy's nightmares which is like what we were just talking about where they had their own little 
cheesy movies that they made to be little segments on this thing that were separated, the show that was separated by Freddie introing these dumb little short movies. And they're really terrible uh, if you've <laughs> never seen them. Uh, there's Mystery Science Theater 3000, of course. Count Floyd is a favorite of mine because he ended up getting looped in on like Cartoon Planet uh, and and all of that later in the 90s. But yeah, he, he was like part of SCTV. So it was almost like he was making fun of horror hosts. So he was really kind of jokey and joking around. And then Cremation Mortem uh, was a, a lady who was sort of Elvira-ish in a way with her look. And then in the 90s, like the big ones that I think a lot of us remember the best, which is like Joe Bob Briggs, Monster Vision, Sandra Bernhardt uh, took over from Gilbert Gottfried on Real Wild Cinema, Rhonda Shear up all night, and The Crypt Keeper uh, from Tales from the Crypt uh, were just, you know, really big, you know, amazing shows. So, uh, yeah. So all of this comes... Uh, from we're, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves though, because we have to go back to the beginning, which is Vampira. So um, Vampira was a, a show that came out in 1954. Um, and it was, she was played by Myla Elizabeth, and I cannot say her last name, Sir Janimi. That's the best I can do. Um, <laughs> so she was the daughter of Finnish immigrants and raised primarily in the U.S. and in Oregon. Um, she said she was born in Finland and that she was the niece of this pro athlete, but she was actually born in, uh, is it Gloucester, Mass or Gloucester? I don't know how they say it over here. I know how they'd probably say it over there, right? Gloucester. Yeah, yeah so it would be Gloucester <laughs> here, but, you know, who knows in Massachusetts? That's right. I have no idea. So um, so she grew up sort of being a little bit of an outcast. She was like a Finnish, like she came from a Finnish family. And so she developed this deep and abiding sympathy for the challenges to the American consensus. She always, this is a quote, she always understood herself as a freak, as weird, as problematic in relation to the wider culture. Her frequent disparaging references and in interviews to the middle class and even to the bourgeoisie seems to be one of the most specific influences she received from the kind of political radicalism that surrounded her. So a lot of the Finnish immigrants were, they tended to be more on like the socialist side, which at the time, you know, you got to think this was like the 20s and 30s, not super popular in America. So um, she always really felt like an outcast. Um, and she really enjoyed as a child, this comic, which was called Terry and the Pirates. And it was notable for subversive depictions of women, in particular, a character called the Dragon Lady, who was a pirate queen, and she was a complex anti-hero. I'm imagining something kind of like a Catwoman type of character. And, mm. um, Myla, which is what she went by Elizabeth as a child, but I'm going to call her Myla because that's what she went by as an adult. Um, she later noted her deep identification with this character. Mm -hmm. So Myla always felt like an outcast and she had practical parents who never really understood her and they were always wanting her to conform. I'm sure a lot of people listening can probably identify with what that feels like. Um, she identified very strongly with outcasts and artists and after graduating high school in 1940, uh, she ran away from home, kind of like hopped on a train and did the whole like 1940s, like moving around just by your wits um, and uh, made it to L.A. to do some modeling shoots, uh, which you can see here. She's uh, she bleached her hair blonde and, you know, she was doing the whole she's very Scandinavian. So she's a, a gorgeous woman. Um, and then she got a gig and she moved to Greenwich Village in New York. And there she found some friends in the beat generation movement. So she was really heavily inspired by the beat. You know, they're called beatniks later, but it was called the beat generation at the time. And they rebelled against conformity and the Norman Rockwell image of America. And the beats embraced the rejection of mater economic materialism and explicit portrayals of the human condition. They, they liked explicit portrayals of that and sexual liberation and exploration. So they were super like, okay with, you know, like gay culture was super embraced by them, which was very like closeted at that time. So 
this was the time when she changed her name from Elizabeth Serenjinimi, I can't say it, to Myla Nurmi. <laughs> so Myla Nurmi is the name that we all kind of know her as now. And she did some modeling and had some small roles. And then she got a part in this Mae West production um, called Catherine the Great. And she ended up getting fired from this production because allegedly Mae West thought she was upstaging her. Now, I, I want to point out Mae West is one of these people who is sort of this, a lot of people say is the source of camp. Like, so campiness, sh she's sort of like, people say that she's like a woman pretending to be a woman. So, right. <laughs> so it's like woman squared, like she's <laughs> overdoing everything. Like it's very dialed up. And so, a lot of the camp stuff kind of comes from, hey, big boy, why don't you? Like, it's that kind of vibe, right? right. So she was very <laughs> influenced by this as well. So she then got a, a job in this horror-themed midnight show, which was called um, Spook Scandals, uh, where she screamed and lay in a coffin. They, it may have just been in the, in the lobby of the show, um, but she apparently this was going to be a prototype for the vampire show because she would scream faint lay in a coffin and seductively lurk around this fake cemetery so she was kind of like this vampire sexy chick and she gained a lot of attention for her performance but the show closed after like two performances and that's where she was seen by this guy named howard hawks who was this powerful figure in hollywood he was instrumental in lauren bacall's uh, career, and he promised her a film role in this movie called Dreadful Hollow, which is this vampire story that was actually written by William Faulkner. Um, oh, wow. But <laughs> unfortunately, like she moved all the way to LA to to make this movie, and then the whole thing fell through. Like so, <laughs> so they didn't end up making the movie, and or they didn't make it fast enough, and she quit. She was like, "You're jerking me around. I quit. I'm not doing this." So she ended up doing some like modeling and what they called leg shows uh, until she met her husband in 1949. So she gets married to this guy named Rudy Gernreich. Gernrich. Um, nope, that's not right. Um, she she got married to. A, a guy, but she met this guy, Rudy Gernrich, and he is this uh, Austrian born American avant garde fashion designer guy, right? He oh. actually made the uniforms from space 1999. Um, oh. And he also is credited <laughs> with inventing the thong. So <laughs> that's an achievement. <laughs> right. So he's very kind of odd avant garde kind of fashion guy. So she got to do some really cool modeling shoots with this guy. Um, and so he also influenced her style and things like that. And so he's probably what got her an invite into this annual Halloween party that was like this gala. And it was run by this guy or uh, hosted by this guy named Lester Horton, Lester Horton. And it was called the Ball Carib. Um, and it's this very big Hollywood unorthodox costume conglomeration of the gay elite, political radicals, lots of super campy stuff going on. She came dressed up in this costume that was inspired by uh, the Adams Family cartoons. This is now this is not the costume that I'm showing on screen, but this is just sort of to give you an idea of kind of what she looked like at that time. So um, she's in this black dress, kind of Morticia like, although, you know, at this time, the Charles Adam cartoons, which I do have like this awesome book here that's got all of the original um, Adams Family cartoons. So they appeared in the New Yorker magazine. So the characters in the family did not have names at that time. So Morticia was not called Morticia. She was just nameless lady who looks like a vampire lady. But uh, Milo really loved that comic series. And so she was kind of doing a tribute to that a little bit. And um, so this is an example of one of the early New Yorker uh, Adams Family comics. They weren't, it wasn't even called the Adams Family. It was just Adams uh, was the cartoonist, right? Mm. So th this producer saw her uh, win this costume contest at this big Halloween party and basically wanted her to host a late night horror program because he had this idea like that, that he could get all of these low rent B movies 
and put them on late night because TV was a brand new thing. And they had all this dead air where they needed to fill space. And so he was like, this would be a cheap and easy way. We could have a host, you know, whatever. And he thought she looked really cool and she could host horror type movies um, on that their channel is a local channel in LA. And so um, Myla modified her character so, so she could be distinct from the Adams Family matriarch and insisted that she satirize these family shows, which were so popular at the time, like I Love Lucy and stuff like that, that depicted marital bliss and the concept of the American housewife. And she kind of wanted to turn that whole image on its head. And so her show, which was initially called Dig Me Later Vampira, aired on April 30th, 1954. So believe it or not, like this was, and it aired after like 10 o'clock. So there was no censors looking at anything that was going on this late at night. So they had a crew of seven people and they had a year, a one-year contract with this KABC uh, channel and it was live. And so they didn't save any footage of her show. It was just one of those kind of like the original Doctor Who, right? Like, yeah. They just filmed it and then it's just lost to time because they weren't, it was so new that they weren't thinking about anything like that. And so eventually the show became publicly known as the Vampira show. And so this is sort of what she looks like in, in that show. And I'm going to play you a clip that gives you a general idea of what her character was like. So here we go. Wait a second. Let me get this straight. Are you telling me that we moved to the murder capital of the world? Are you serious? Screaming ah! really mad, you think so? What I need is a vampire cocktail to settle my nerves. It'll not only settle them, it will petrify them. You know, I've often been asked why I don't light my attic with electricity. Isn't that ridiculous? Everybody knows electricity is for chairs. It's about a humorous fellow who dies telling a joke. Something of a deadpan comedian. Here. The vampire, that's a name. I think there's somebody coming. Yes, it's my sister, Vampira. Would you like to go out with me after your death? Would I like to go out with you? Now is your chance to send the kids out of the room. <laughs> Why don't you invite me over sometime when you cut yourself shaving? Oh, let's not get sickening about it. <laughs> Young man, who are you? What is this? We can have a nice little. Ah! Oh, step on the cat's tail. I don't see any cat. Oh, we don't have a cat. Uh, just his tail. <laughs> KBC provided an antique car, so Vampira could appear at random all over Los Angeles, provoking havoc in street theater wherever she went. Uh, may I ask you a question, Miss Vampira? Yeah, surely. Is that really your waist, or do you come in two sections? <laughs> <laughs> two sections. I'm kind of a do-it-myself kit. Oh. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I, a lot of the footage, and I'm happy and sad that a little tiny clip of the Lost Boys got in there at the beginning. I guess I clicked a little too high up on the, the screen. So sorry about that. But um, yeah, so I wanted you to see her because she plays it straight. She plays it a lot more like what we're used to seeing with Morticia, right? Like she feels a lot more like that than what we're going to see when you start showing us Elvira's shtick. Like it's very different. And She's kind of making what I think of as like visual jokes similar to the Adams Family comics with a lot of these mm. things. 
Like you can kind of feel the little cheesy one-liners, but remember it was 1954. So um, basically she alluded to sex covertly, she said with her opening scream, she said she was trying to make it almost like this orgasmic thing, like to, sl to slip that in there. Um, oh. And she used the waist cincher, which was very prominent in bondage magazines at the time. And she said she did that to, completely deny the whole idea of fertility because remember this is during the years that the baby boom was happening after the war and so women were like w seen as you know fertile and being moms and pregnancy and all that stuff and she was like no i want to look like partially a corpse with this tiny waist and also not something that can ever give birth to anything um she had lots of phallic symbols in there so she wore spiky heels and had these long sharp fingernails and um some of her skits even alluded to bondage imagery as well so we don't have a lot of those on film but uh she would talk about them and describe what they looked like so due to the scarcity of access to horror films at the time, because remember, this is before the Universal Monsters films like came out where you could actually get a copy of them. Um, they had to kind of show some crime thrillers rather than monster movies in some cases, because they just didn't have enough easy access to cheap B horror movies at the time. And um, so the first episode that they showed of her show uh, sparked this craze. And by that summer, Myla was in Life magazine and she was on that George Goebel show, which was a huge variety show, which had like a national audience. So that she actually had like within a few months, this huge national level exposure of who she was. It was she it seemed like she was on the, the quick path to fame. Right. And she did a lot of this performance art type stuff, which it talked about in the clip where she would go out and do these public uh, stunts. She always stayed in full character. So she would never just be hanging out being Myla. She was always fully vampire if she had that costume on. And uh, she would like uh, stay very sexy and spoke about death and the macabre and basically implied that the 50s housewife was essentially dead inside. So why not call it out? Um, <laughs> she refused to be submissive. So even though they talk about Lucy, like in I Love Lucy being this big, like amazing, like symbol of like she was the powerful woman, the show was about her. She still had a husband that came through the door and and sort of put her in her place but vampira doesn't have a husband she's just like a woman who's single and she's in control of her show and so that was kind of revolutionary in this subversive way and in march of 1955 which was like the following march she was nominated for best outstanding new female personality at the emmys um but she lost to lucy which i think you know to lose to i to lucy is like i mean still kind of a big deal but at the mm -hmm. time you know she was only taking home like 58 dollars a week and a lot of that she had to buy her own makeup she had to buy cab fare to get to work so she wasn't really making any money and you know she's thinking you know this is still her ticket right so abc management wanted to franchise this show her show rather than taking it national she of course wanted to take it national. And she insisted that she kept always at least 51% of the rights to her character. Um, so they wanted to do a thing where each region would have its own vampire, and then Milo would just be one of the many vampires that would be in the greater LA area. Um, she was fiercely protective and controlling of her creation because it was really the only thing that she owned, right? And I will say that is the first nail in Vampira's coffin. Uh -huh. In the summer of 1955, there was this um, actress called Sharon Dexter uh, who filed a $100,000 lawsuit over this ad gimmick where they had superimposed Vampira's face over this actress's face in some sort of weird ad gimmick. Now, Vampira herself had nothing to do with this. It was just something that ABC had done. But they still, ABC got mad because they associated Vampire with them. Mm. Um, and then, but probably the biggest reason that she got canceled, uh, her show got canceled, was her separation and divorce from her husband, who's in his teens, um, He had been a child actor. He's at UC here. He's in the center. She had hands with Ronald Reagan. 
Um, and so he, she's getting divorced from him. And um, she was also friends with James Dean at the time. Um, and unfortunately, when he died in September of 1955, there were all these rumors that came up that she had, she's a witch and that she had put a curse on him and that that's why he died. And of course, oh, wow. <laughs> but, you know, she was already kind of subversive. They, they were doing all this stuff to kind of like smooth over her image in the press, like, well, she does have a husband and it's just like a little gimmick that she does. That's cute and fun. And they're trying to like make her less creepy and make her more socially acceptable. And she just wasn't going along with it. So um, she ended up going to this rival channel when they canceled her show, um, KHJ Channel 9, to try to revive her show. But those James Dean rumors continued with this article that came out in the Washington Post, uh, which kind of used a bunch of hearsay and stuff like that she had supposedly said uh, that was written by this really bad gossip columnist at the time. And that was really the final nail in her coffin uh, in terms of getting blacklisted, which is what happened. So she got fired after 13 episodes of that show and she could not get work anywhere because of this whole James Dean thing. So oh no. <laughs> I will skip over a lot of the stuff that happens after that because it's, it, it's, there's a lot, but it's this great book. I highly recommend if you guys like Vampire or you're interested. It's really, really good. It's called Vampire, Dark Goddess of Horror. Um, so I, I read this and it's the source of a lot of what I'm talking about. So um, Ed Wood uh, is the thing that most people remember her for. Um, and, and probably because of the the movie that was made in the 90s, right? Like it, it's not so much the actual Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's the movie about Ed Wood and his life in which... Um, Lisa Marie plays Vampira, and she's not accurately playing Vampira. I just want to point out, but that's like okay. But I'm just saying it's don't take that as the truth, hundred um, percent. Oh. I will say that in if this that film was in 1957, and she was in really dire need of money because she could not get work. Um, so that's why she took the role. But she read his script. And she thought it sucked so much that she refused to speak in it. She had lines, but she was like, if you want me to be in this movie, I'm not speaking. So that's why her character is mute in the movie. <laughs> uh, <Bit> extreme. <laughs> yeah, but again, this just shows her personality. So again, she's very controlling of this thing that she created, even though it's essentially been taken away from her, even though she fought for it, right? Um, so I think you, you want to talk a little bit about, uh, the, there's this transition, like she kind of just goes, falls into obscurity, um, uh, from the late fifties through the sixties and seventies. And so Conrad, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. <laughs> yes. Do let me know if my microphone is still too quiet and I'll try and boost it up a little bit more. It sounds great to me, but okay. I'll get closer and sort of shout directly in everyone's ears. So in uh, August 1981, the Los Angeles based independent TV station KHJ TV approached Myla about reviving Vampira, but it quickly became apparent that she'd struggle to recreate the character. Although she was only 59 years old at this point, uh, Cassandra Peterson, who would end up playing Elvira, uh, said that it was clear that she'd lived a very hard life um, and she only had a tooth or two left in her head and rambled incoherently about unrelated topics. Now, that's what Cassandra says. I don't get the sense that Cassandra is a sort of bitter, unpleasant, sort of bitchy kind of person. So, right. But there was a bit of a feud between the two of them, so I guess check your sources and bear that in mind <laughs> um they started looking for a younger actress to play vampire's daughter and in exchange for the use of the name myla would get executive producer credit and collect a weekly royalty payment uh myla and larry thomas the eventual show's creator chuck bologna the station manager and walt baker the program director met with a young hopeful called cassandra peterson so 
a little introduction to Cassandra. She was born on the 17th of September 1951 in Manhattan, Kansas. <laughs> she, when wow. she was 18 months old, she pulled a pot of boiling water onto herself and she almost died after sustaining third degree burns over a third of her body. She was saved by an experimental new treatment that they tried as a last resort. And that is a newspaper clipping I'm showing. And um, uh, yeah, that says Cassandra is better. So she made the local news when she managed to recover, which is really cute. She saw her first horror movie when she was eight. It was William Castle's House on Haunted Hill. And she was fascinated and repelled by it, but she subsequently <laughs> fell in love with the Roger Corman adaptations of Edgar Allan Poe and her idol, Vincent Price, who she would go on to meet and co-star in an episode of her show. Uh, she became a go-go dancer in a local nightclub at the age of 14 after winning a local dancing competition and was determined to become a Las Vegas showgirl and was picked out of the crowd by management when she persuaded her parents to take her to a show during a family vacation. Uh, she was quite successful in that, but after a while it became a bit repetitive and mechanical night after night. And she was persuaded by none other than Elvis Presley. Honestly, her autobiography is a blast. If you want to read it, it's really good. You won't believe her life. So Elvis Presley told her to take some singing lessons and to get out of Vegas before she sank into drugs and prostitution. Wow. So, yeah, he said, I've seen it happen so often to show girls, please get out now while the going's good. So she did. She spent some time in Italy. She appeared in the, as a background player in a Fellini movie. Um, <laughs> but after wow. a while, she, she returned to the US. Yeah, she does. She's in the background of Fellini's Roma, if you look closely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she returned to the US and set her sights on a career in acting. And she spent four years with LA's foremost improvisational group, The Groundlings. Um, ah, yes. The lineup from 1980. Eagle eyed viewers will spot Pee Wee Herman in there, fifth from the left in the back row with amazing hair. <gasps> oh my God. Yeah, wow. That's Paul Rubens. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Cassandra is at the bottom on the left. Yes. Yeah. So she was in the Groundlings. So she was learning improvisational comedy at that point and getting really good at it. Um, so going back to being called in about this Vampira gig, daughter of Vampira, she recruited her friend Robert Redding, who she'd met working on a musical comedy review show called Mama's Boys in the 70s to help her come up with the character's image. I would like to show you um, a shot from Mama's Boys. There is one in her autobiography. It is not safe for broadcast on YouTube, I'm afraid. Oh, no. It's a bit racy. But yeah, that's where she met Robert. And Robert did these amazing sketches. Uh, the first version of the character that they came up with took inspiration from Sharon Tate's character from Roman Polanski's The Fearless Vampire Killers. So it would have utilized Cassandra's own red wavy hair and pale dead girl makeup and a pale pink tattered gown. The suits at the station didn't yeah. like it. They wanted a girl in a black dress. So the second Who version... Doesn't? <laughs> well, exactly. <clears throat> so the second version utilized Redding's recent experience of Japanese kabuki style makeup from a production of Macbeth, topped off with a beehive hairdo inspired by Ronnie Spector of the Ronettes. And Cassandra and Robert were surprised that the station didn't balk at the plunging neckline. In fact, their only note when they sent in this sketch was that they wanted the slit revealing the leg a little higher. Now, if any of you have seen Elvira in action, 
that split goes pretty high uh, in, in the finished <laughs> finished thing. Yeah, I mean, that's why we had French cut underwear in the 80s, right? Like, so it's really high, so you can wear really high slits. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's pretty daring. So speaking of the feud, so completely out of nowhere, according to Cassandra, during the first day of filming, program director Walt Baker burst into the studio to announce that Myla, um, her attorney had called and they couldn't use the name Vampire after all they she'd pulled out. She was unhappy that they'd cast a comedic actress in the role. And according to an interview in a 2005 issue of Bizarre magazine, she'd wanted 39 year old African American singer Lola Falana to play the part. And I think you talk about that a little bit more later. Yeah. But um, the director, Larry Thomas, started a brainstorm for an alternative name. They all put suggestions into a Folgers coffee can and Cassandra pulled out Elvira. She thought it sounded like a country singer, possibly because of the recent crossover hit Elvira from the Oak Ridge Boys, but mm -hmm. they went with it. And Elvira's movie Macabre debuted on Saturday, the 26th of September, 1981, at midnight, featuring the film The Grave of the Vampire. Um, <laughs> and I've got a little clip for you uh, so that you can get a sense of her shtick. It's very different from uh, Vampira. She plays it as kind of a valley girl who's streetwise, takes no nonsense, I will say, to stay PG-13, um, mm -hmm. and is quite sarcastic and satirical. And uh, it, yeah, it's a different energy from Vampire, uh, Vampire altogether. So here it is. Hello, darling. It's me, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, the sassy lassie with the classy chassis. <laughs> oh, thanks for bringing me into your home. Now, when are you going to clean up this dump and put some clothes on? Jeez. I know what you're up to. You think you're pretty smart, don't you? I'm as smart as a cook in a cheap chow man joint. Oh, that's smart, huh? <laughs> you know, the fact that you decided to stay home with me for the next two hours and watch this turkey tells me a lot about you. It tells me you couldn't get a date. <laughs> Basically correct. So you thought you'd get your jollies by watching She Demons. You're just hoping that some sleazy, cheesy sex exploitation flick with beautiful girls running around half naked, their breasts heaving against their flimsy, shredded blouses, their milky white thighs beckoning from beneath their tattered skirts. That's what you're after, isn't it? Yes, precisely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, she was quite confrontational as well. So, yes. yeah. And uh, she was a big hit. Uh, Larry Thomas wrote the shows in the beginning uh, with pure vaudeville jokes. And because the movies varied quite dramatically in length, they would have to create between 15 to 30 minutes of host segments to break up the show and pad out the running time to their full TV slot that they had. So to try and help out with the workload, Cassandra suggested they bring on her fellow Groundlings member, John Paragon, to help with the workload. Uh, John also appeared in the show as a recurring character known as The Breather, who would call in <laughs> during the show to yeah. share, to sort of to do heavy breathing at her and then do a terrible dad joke. <laughs> I've seen yeah. some examples. They are, mm -hmm. uh, they are pretty pretty sad but you know it all pads out this the time and the breather was very popular sure uh, the f the films were all from the parent company rko's library they were really crappy but uh cassandra quite liked that because uh, she and john found it was easier to write jokes for the crappy films than it was for the good ones so kind of like mystery science theater probably like yeah exactly yeah i yeah. mean the only difference is she doesn't riff during it, although in, in a revival in the 2010, so I watched an example of that today, uh, she does actually pop up on the screen occasionally and make uh, wisecracks at what's happening in the movie. But I don't right. think she did in the original show. I might be wrong right. on that. 
I don't think so. I don't, that's mm. not my memory of it. Yeah. She had many famous cameos during the show's original five season run in the early 80s, including John Carradine, Paul Rubens, of course, uh, John Astin, Ed McMahon, Barbara Billingsley, Cheech Marin, Hervé Vilches, and Arsenio Hall. And she had Vincent Price on for her Halloween special, which was a huge moment for her. She was over the moon. Sure. And she even broke new technological ground. So on the 22nd of May 1982, she became one of the first shows to broadcast in 3D on their episode with Vincent Price's film The Mad Magician from 1954. 2.7 million pairs of 3D glasses were sold through participating 7-Eleven stores in Southern California and they even ran out of stock according to the LA Times. Can you imagine so, that? <laughs> I just have a question about that. So remember TVs in 1982? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I've been to movie theaters where the glasses didn't really do anything. So I can't imagine that it actually did anything, but no. it's a great gimmick. <laughs> it's a great gimmick. I guess you're dealing with like 300 lines, but you can just imagine what Cassandra was thrusting towards the cat. That's what I keep thinking as well. And, you know, I also am looking at the screen with between your little jack o' lantern you have in the lower right corner and, you know, some of the stuff that you're talking about. And I just keep thinking of the Halloween 3 movie season of The Witch, where mm. it's got the little silver shamrock jingle playing. So now that can be in everybody's head along with mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's just mean. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So Elvira went from strength to strength. She took over from Wolfman Jack as the host of the Knott's Berry Farms Halloween Haunt in 1982. I don't know what that is, uh, but yet yeah, it's a big thing. And she was massively successful hosting it. She what? did it off and on <laughs> for 20 years. Okay. Why does this look like the John Travolta? Is it the second? Saturday Night Fever movie. What's that called? Oh, Where... Staying Alive. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it looks very... like Staying Alive. It does. Isn't it's that very the same year as? I feel like it's the same year. It's like the red, glittery, sequiny top. Like, looks like the lady's dress in that movie a little bit. It really does. It really does. Okay. Yeah. Cassandra's caption in the book underneath this is, you can tell it's 1982 from the men's <laughs> costumes. <laughs> so, yeah. I love it. They're great. Yeah. It's great. Uh, most importantly to her, and it's interesting that this mirrors what you were saying about Vampira, she managed to secure the rights to the character in in totality. And it, it's become really important to her just in terms of her longevity and just her maintaining a living because with her it's a lot of merchandising, a lot of tie-ins that she's done. And she sure. said it's She's quite lucky in that respect because otherwise the ac you know the sequence of acquisitions that followed with that particular TV station it would have been swallowed up by Disney and just disappeared as you can imagine right but yeah she did a lot of um, tie in. So in 1983, she released Elvira Pre Presents Vinyl Macabre, Oldies But Ghoulies, which was a collection of Halloween standards like the Monster Mash and Sheb Woolley's The Purple People Eater, interspersed with snarky comments from herself. Um, I had that like as a record. Like, really? That, <laughs> a, yeah. Or a vinyl <laughs> album, like, if you want to be. Like, but we called them records back in the day. And I had this little kid record player and I had like the Monster Mash and uh, all those, the, uh, what's the other one? Purple People Eater. I had all that stuff on a little yeah. record. So, You've got to play yeah, it when awesome. you've got people showing up to get candy, haven't you? You do. I should. I should, actually. Yeah. It's good. Um, yep. Yeah. But, yep, she kept going from strength to strength. So in 1984, she was a VJ on MTV for a six-hour Halloween special. She did it again in 1986. Uh, I remember she, that one. She was rumored to be 
writer Rod Temperton's first choice to perform the spoken word parts of Michael Jackson's thriller, but she lost out to her mm. idol Vincent Price, who happened to be the producer Quincy Jones's wife's best friend's husband. <laughs> See if you can, it's all about who you know. It is. See <laughs> or if you who can, you know that you know that you know. Yeah, just try and map that one out in your head. I can't. Um, <laughs> she appeared in lots of other shows. I saw one of the commenters point out that she was on Chips once. Um, for me, I was quite excited to find out that she was on a few episodes of The Fall Guy with Lee oh, yeah. Majors. <laughs> Lee Majors? Yes. <laughs> Don't you just love it? I do. Um, she led the parade of villains at Walt Disney World. She appeared in two Bob Hope specials. She appeared in Cheech Marin's music video, Born in East L.A., and she became a figure in L.A. Movie Land's Wax Museum. So, yeah. Is it good? Is it a good likeness, do you think? I don't know. I've no idea. I've just seen her on a Joan Rivers talk show saying that the way that they did it, they just said to her that they could, they could do it without taking any mods. They just needed to feel her with their hands. Oh, uh, yeah. You I've, know I've gotten that like. line before, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know what she's like. I do. Uh, during 1986, she became the first female sponsor of Coors Beer, replacing, uh, slowly edging out the Beer Wolf character for the brewer's promotions around Halloween se season. And people kept stealing the life-size cardboard standees from stores there's an yeah. example there on the right yeah they uh -huh. didn't last long as soon as they put one up it would vanish <laughs> i remember these like i remember this uh this the whole, whole campaign. Ad campaign yeah yeah for sure yeah it it was just around about the time that cause wanted wanted to make sort of a, a sort of a thing out of Halloween being a party time for teenagers with beer because previously apparently <laughs> just been for kids not for teenagers but yeah it's it's so funny because you've got this ad campaign coming out up against like the whole like mothers against drunk driving you know the the ag councils like don't drink and all that stuff that's yeah. also aimed at teenagers so it's just it's kind of funny Yes. <laughs> in to 19 <laughs> Yeah, well, here's another topic for you that you'll be very familiar with. So in 1988, the Satanic Panic finally oh, yeah. hit these corporations. Rumors spread that the CEO of Procter and Gamble had admitted he was donating huge profits to the Church of Satan. Is that That's a thing? That's true. It is. Really? Based oh, in, lovely. Based in California. Oh. Well, freedom of religion, I guess. Um, but this was untrue. He never said it. I don't know no. why this rumor was spread. But Cause panicked and they killed Elvira's Halloween campaign despite its runaway success. Jeffrey Cause, the CEO of Cause, not surprisingly, thought that Elvira was satanic. <laughs> now, does this at all remind you of the whole James Dean vampire is a witch and put a hex on him and killed him kind of crap? It does, doesn't it? It's amazingly yeah. similar. And all she is yeah, is a I, woman in a black dress being a bit sort of camp and doing a bit of Halloween shtick. It's stupid. I know. Well, and there's also like several other things like the, the fact that I think neither one of them got along with their mothers very well. Um, they mm. both have ties to Elvis Presley um, because Vampira knew Elvis before he made it big. Really? Uh, and oh. met him. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of like weird similarities between the two of them. Yeah. Beyond just wow. the costume, right? So I think yeah. if, if the whole rivalry thing hadn't happened, you know, I think that they could have been people who, like, if if it hadn't turned into that, that they would have gotten along pretty well in a way. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think they fell foul of the same things. Yeah. Um, so that didn't stop Elvira. Pepsi snapped her up. And they paid her twice as much to sponsor Mandarin Orange Slice and Mug Root Beer for their 1989 and 1990 Halloween campaigns. Have you heard of or tasted either of those drinks? I definitely have had both of those. 
Really? Wow. What are they oh, like? Yeah. <laughs> well, so Slice is, I believe it's like an orange drink. Uh, oh, okay. I, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I, it's not something I drink a lot. But um, I do love that it's Slice. It's one of those mm. words that a lot of people hate, and it goes nicely with the whole knife aesthetic. Um, but then, of course, <laughs> Mug Root Beer is just sort of like a you know, a, a lower end root beer, which root beer is kind of a, not something I like. I don't really like that flavor, but I have okay. had it in my life. So, mm. oh, I mean, it's go. okay. They have fancier ones out there now that are like glass bottles and pretentiousness and all that. But I mean, yeah, it's fine for root beer. Yeah. It's not okay. my bag. Yeah. Well, Cassandra made a lot of dough. <laughs> selling Good for her. and cause came crawling back after their sales slumped and she became their queen of halloween until 1995 when they tried to subtly diminish her role you know just uh you know just like no tv ads just small cardboard displays in stores just to make it look like she failed and that's why they uh -huh. cancelled her so she quit and just walked away from it yeah, so they tried to say, we're okay with Satan, and she was like, bye. Bye, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. So, Movie Macabre was cancelled in 1986 after five seasons, and in 1988, she released her first movie, Mistress of the Dark, which she co-wrote with John Paragon, the breather, and Sam Egan, who wrote the episodes of The Fall Guy that she'd appeared in. Mm -hmm. um, was directed by James Signorelli, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, who created all of Saturday Night Live's filmed segments. NBC originally approached her about doing a sitcom, but Cassandra pushed for a movie first because back in those days, yeah, if you were a movie star, you could do more movies and maybe do TV as well. But you, if you were a TV star, you just couldn't get into movies. Now, of course, everybody's everywhere and it doesn't make any difference. Sure. Well, and TV yeah. isn't really a thing. TV. There's just Netflix and Amazon and whatever. Yeah. Um, I won't go into this in a huge amount of detail. Um, if you want to hear more about, if you want to hear a Brit and a Kiwi who had no idea who the hell Elvira was, experience it for the first time. Listen to episode 115 of Movie Oubliette. But I can say... Yes, yeah. first, I just have to say, I've listened to that episode. It's extremely fun. I remember when you put it out, I had just seen the movie just coincidentally as well. Like, again, like I've, I saw it back when it came out. But um, but yeah, it is it is fun to hear the two of you because it blows my mind that like there's anyone who hasn't heard of, of Elvira. Like it's just yeah. <laughs> I can understand people not knowing who the vampire is. Uh, just because of what ended up happening to her. But Elvira, like she is just, she was everywhere in the 80s. Like you could not miss her. She was huge. Yeah, but not outside Not over the there. US, that's that's I don't funny. Think. Yeah. It's a great movie though. It's uh, so. <laughs> great. Which it is, it's, it's really fun. She goes, she funny. scandalizes a small conservative town that she visits in search of her past and the money she needs to fund her Vegas debut. So she's playing Elvira and as though she is in the show, you see her doing her show at the beginning of it and all the TV producers are really sleazy. And just the the way that she ter just terrorizes this very conservative town and particularly Edie McClurg as the hilariously shrewish <laughs> character <laughs> chastity pariah which <laughs> gives us a link to our previous episode because of course Edie appears as the marathon car <laughs> rental clerk in planes trains and automobiles and has a fantastic line <laughs> which oh we yeah repeat <laughs> no but she's the lady who gets the f-bomb thrown at her a whole bunch of times in that movie it's so. yeah and then yeah. she taps it by giving it back. <laughs> which yeah. Is great. It's awesome. Uh, so the movie opened at number three in the box office on the 30th of September 1988 behind the Tom Hanks vehicle punchline and Sigourney <laughs> Weaver's Gorillas in the Mist. 
and its takings were growing. So word of mouth was helping this movie grow week on week. But it was pulled from theatres when it was announced that uh, the distributor, New World Pictures, one of its co-founders was under investigation for fraud. Michael <laughs> Milken, the junk bond king. Is this oh, a yeah. phenomenon you remember? Absolutely. Yeah. This yep. was a, a big thing in the 80s, right? Like late right. 80s, uh, junk bonds. Yeah, it's even alluded to in The Wedding Singer. Um, the guy that uh, she's going to marry, the, the jerk right. that she's going to marry in that movie. Uh, he says he's, I can't remember what he says, is that, but she's like, he's in junk bonds. So it's kind of oh. alluding to this. Yeah. I didn't even know what that was. Yeah. So, yeah. So that everyone got scared that New World Pictures wouldn't be able to fund ongoing advertising for the movie. So they pulled it. So it was devastating for Cassandra because she really thought that she was going to go places with this, but it, it didn't get anywhere. So now it's kind of a cult hit that's mm. much loved. Particularly, I think it appeals to people because... It's the story of a misfit who's misunderstood and sometimes demonized by ignorant people on the basis of how she looks. But she mm -hmm. manages to find her people and achieve her dreams, which is spinning tassels on her nipples in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> but go her. Uh, and it it resonated with everybody it's a skill. who felt like an outcast. It, it, it is, yeah. It's a real skill that she learned in vegas and she can still do where it now, else are you going to learn that skill i mean well yeah <laughs> not not at the university of cambridge i'll tell you that much <laughs> um, no not in the bible belt either i can assure you okay well so she for, for that and many other reasons she she resonated with the lgbtq plus community in a big way i mean i mean also it's high camp but also this idea of somebody who's an outcast who's unapologetically flaunting their sexuality but never a sex object and never a pushover was really empowering and and yeah so she was a big hit for that community mm -hmm. she didn't make another film until the privately funded elvira's haunted hills which was released direct to video on halloween in 2002 it's not a direct sequel to the first movie. It's a period horror comedy, very much in the style of Hammer movies. And it mm -hmm. was filmed in Romania, near what would historically have been called Transylvania. So that's quite cute. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> in 1993, and I've, I'm so thrilled to show this to you, she recorded a pilot for a sitcom called The Elvira Show for CBS. And it featured Cassandra playing Elvira with her aunt, played by Catherine Helmond, as two witches with a wise-cracking, talking black cat who are joined by their long-lost niece, a teenage girl who also has supernatural powers. Is this sounding familiar to you at all? It sounds really familiar. It does. Well, I have some clips to show you so you can get a sense of what it was like. Here's, okay. here's a fun one. Oh, Chip, I see big things in your future. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes. Would you like to see more? <laughs> <coughs> now, wow. Unfortunately, that was her undoing because a CBS executive called Howard Stringer was passing in the hallway when a bunch of people were watching this pilot and they were all killing themselves laughing. And he walked in and took one look at this and said, we cannot have, let's say boobs to be more polite, but we cannot have that on CBS. And so the pilot did not go anywhere. So how long after this was Baywatch? I just need to know. <laughs> not not <I> mean, long. Because, <laughs> wow. Anyway. Yeah. And <laughs> not long after that was Sabrina the Teenage Witch, which was a smash hit when it premiered three years later. And it has an oddly familiar setup. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Here's yeah, a couple more crazy. clips for you to give you a sense. Of, here's one of my favorite gags in the pilot. I enjoyed watching this. It's on YouTube if everybody wants to check it out. Uh, let's see. There must be lots of fun things for you guys to do in this town. <gasps> Look, the future farmers of the Flatlands are having a cakewalk and corn shucking contest. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Well, actually, I'm rather tired. Why don't you go shuck yourself, dear? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good um, for, for a nice every sitcom time, every time i see her uh that's katherine helmand i just think of mona from who's the boss and i'm just like i mean her voice is just her voice and yeah. i don't know it's i can She's see tight. this having been like i i could see this like getting at least a full season back at when it would have come out so yeah, for a 90s yeah. sitcom, it's pretty good. But yeah, here's another little clip that shows the cat in action, just so you can feel the similarities with Sabrina. Sure. Chip, Chip are you okay? Chip! <laughs> Gosh, he's hard as a rock! Well, wasn't that the whole point? <laughs> Wait a minute. What's this? Timber! <laughs> oh my God, Zilla! He's a policeman. What am I going to do with a big, stiff cop? I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 So it, it it's remarkably similar to Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Cassandra points that out in her autobiography, and she feels really sad that they didn't get a shot at it just because one executive didn't like it. Um, the the executive or maybe really... he liked it too much. Oh, yeah, maybe. The executive that was really pulling for the show was uh, sick the day that it was reviewed and the decision was made. So, yeah. Mm. Wow. It it just didn't happen, unfortunately. I do love all of the wood paneling and the brown couch. Like, that is exceptional. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's It's a shame. It really is a shame. Yeah, it is. We, we lost out on something there. Uh, her original show, a movie macabre, that was revived several times, first in 2010 for a 26-episode season, and then for 13 Nights of Elvira on Hulu in the run-up to Halloween in 2014. And most recently, of course, she was on Shudder, the streaming service, for Elvira's 40th anniversary, very scary, very special special. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I uh, haven't seen these. Have you watched any of these? So the 2010-26 episode season is actually on Amazon Prime here in the UK. So yeah, I was able mm -hmm. to watch one of those today and it's really funny. It's very Mystery oh. Science Theatre 3000 though. Okay. Well, that's to... not a bad thing. I think, no, no, yeah. not at all. I loved it. I thought it was really, really funny. They're They're both cut from the same cloth, so I don't think it's too much of a stretch to kind of bring that in in that way so that's mm. interesting maybe i'll check yep. it out yeah so the feud uh, <laughs> yes why we're all here <laughs> we, lo <laughs> we love a feud right we love a good fight so shortly after elvira's movie macabre became a ratings hit in la cassandra says that myla filed a lawsuit against the station, the director, and Cassandra personally for stealing her character. And Cassandra had to borrow $35,000 for lawyers' fees at a time when she was earning less than $500 per show. And in the end, Myla didn't even show up in court and the judge ruled against her in absentia. Uh, Cassandra claims that Myla sent heavies to her public appearances to heckle and threaten her and even got physical with her on one occasion. But I don't know how true that is again, but Cassandra seems very reasonable to me. Uh, she also claims that Myla sent nude photographs of her to the major networks when she was on the verge of signing a deal for a cartoon show called Little Elvira, which was promptly shelved. And... But she says, again, no bitterness, she says, quote, for all the trouble she caused me, she was still television's first horror host, and I owe her a debt of gratitude for paving the way for me and all the horror hosts to follow. So she seems kind of philosophical about it. I don't know if that's just for the benefit of her book, 
but she seems like a very reasonable grounded person so i don't know yeah. what do you know about it from um myla's side so from myla's side uh she uh, myla felt that um although she herself she and she knew this and admitted this she was way too old to play vampira in 1981 so she never had it in her mind that she was going to be vampira at that point she didn't want the character to be represented by a young bouncy young woman like a naive ditzy valley girl type person um okay. she wanted someone to be she didn't want them to be younger than 30. She needed someone to, in their mid thirties and to be an old dark soul. So like her original incarnation, she wanted Vampira to buck the system. So, which in the early eighties, that would have been like a, a conservative backlash against the feminist movement. Like, uh, so um, women on TV at that time were often bouncy giggly tanned blonde so think about like chrissy from three's company uh and i know that like suzanne summers just recently passed so there's no shade to her as a person but in terms of what the the hollywood system was putting out there as women on television i think uh myla's instincts were to subvert that because that's how her brain worked right yeah um so she didn't want what what is often called this male. Uh, sh she thought that uh, this was a male fantasy with no sharp edges, like a gothic jiggle TV type thing. Um, so she felt like it was catering to the male gaze, even though like, you know, Elvira kind of carves out her own niche in this. Right. And I, I, I don't know if Mila gets that completely right, but that was her take on it remember she's from a an older generation as well uh yeah. so her short success had begun the trend of horror hosts as you said uh it put older horror films on the screen for all of us kids to watch and fall in love with the genre and that combination of sex death and laughter was just really appealing to uh the later boomers and our whole gen x generation so um i think all of us owe a debt of gratitude to her and shows like hers because and and elvira's as well because they put horror movies even crappy ones on tv all the time on like friday saturday nights so we grew up with these things and we saw movies we otherwise never would have even heard of and um so i just wanted to point out like some of the other reasons why uh, Vampira may have, uh, Myla may have reacted the way she did. So in 1967, she had been contacted. This was when she was blacklisted and she was also struggling financially really bad. Um, so she was contacted by Dawn Post Studios. They, they did like a lot of rubber masks, like Halloween masks, about creating a vampire Halloween mask. Um, and Dawn Post is called like the father of Halloween. And he's the creator of the Shatner mask that they used in the Michael Myers costume. Um, yeah. So um, she did make money from this, but she did not make money from when they did like this. I think they did a Drac Pack Hanna-Barbera type there was a cartoon in the 70s which was like a hannah barbera like monster movie thing and they had this character named vampira uh so yeah a lot of us may remember that um and then there were as you talked about there have been um when we get to 1981 and the the whole elvira or the vampire tv show came back up again um there were rumors about who she had wanted to play uh, the part and she really wanted uh, a person of color to be in that role um, mm. and so so she felt like this was the way to poke the system more so than like sexy time like which she felt like Cassandra was more this young buxom chick she wanted to like subvert that in this way so um, there's Lola Falana which who, she was known as Black Venus in a lot of these what were called black exploitation films at the time, and there there are also rumors that she was looking at Martine Beswick, uh, who was a Bond girl, and she played these seductive and dangerous women uh, really well. Um, Channel Nine wanted this 
more fun version and less controversy. They didn't really, they weren't looking to subvert, you know, the, the dominant paradigm. They were just more about like, they wanted something fun and campy and um, not edgy. So they basically were like cutting her out of the process. And so she just like lost it. And I, I really feel like she took it out unfairly on Cassandra when she should have been directing her anger at the studio, right? Like the yeah. network. Um, but for whatever reason, she just, you know, she focused all of her rage onto Cassandra. Um, she was mad that they had changed Vampire into something that she read as silly and superficial. Um she thought that Elvira played a parody of herself and was joking more about her boobs than the movies. Uh, and she was instead of playing a parody of America's expectations for women. So Myla's coming from much more of a feminist, like, you know, she had a, a whole thought process in mind and she felt like this was much more comedic Valley girl stuff. Now I will say the Valley girl thing ends up becoming like, look at someone like Buffy you know, she has that Valley Girl speak, but she's also a very strong female character. So just because Elvira has some of these traits does not mean she's not also a strong female character, I would argue. Mm. But I do think that, you know, from Myla's perspective, she felt like they took her character away from her yet again. Like, so the system just screwed her over and took her thing from her again. And so I think it was really devastating to her just on a personal level. And so it doesn't excuse some of, if, if she did all of these horrible things to Cassandra, there's no excuse for that. But I kind of do understand like why she was so hurt. Yeah. So It's just a shame that you end up with a system that sort of pitches the women against each other when really it's the system that's a fault rather than them. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, as we're winding down, I wanted to kind of look at just a couple other really fun shows. I know we kind of touched on these earlier, but um, there are several shows from the 80s, particularly Freddy's Nightmares, uh, that I remember. And I wanted to tell this little story. So back in the late 80s, when this show came on, they had like... Over here, I don't know if they had them over there, but over here they had these things that were like 1-900 numbers. And so you would call them and they charged you money. And so you would run up your phone bill like tremendous. It was like, you know, $1.99 a minute or something. It was like crazy. And so you call it and they would have this recording that would like keep you on the line. And they had one for <laughs> Freddy's Nightmare. So it was like, freddy krueger and you call it up and he would like tell you a horror story and it was like robert england's voice recorded and it would just play on this recording that you would like listen to and i called it at least once and of course i got in trouble because i mean it's if you stay on there for like 10 minutes it's like 30 bucks or something like that it gets right, crazy yeah. um so yeah uh, so that was a fun little story. And then, of course, um, like I said, Count Floyd was used frequently on like Space Ghost, not the Space Ghost Coast to Coast, but Space Ghost had Cartoon Planet. And so they would show little clips as well, but they would show clips of like cartoons and things and they would play cartoons and they were the hosts. And Count Floyd would be one of the things they would cut to. So uh, I have a lot of fond memories of those. And um, Joe Bob Briggs. I, I just, you know, he's, he's an interesting character as a, as a personality. He's got another show like Elvira's where he's, he's still on TV. I think he's gone shutter and you can watch a lot of him hosting horror movies. He's really, really, really good at, he knows so much about B movies. It's insane. Like it's crazy. The amount of information he has just in his brain about all these movies. Um, and then the Crypt Keeper, I, I hate puppets, but for some reason, I love him. I watched that show <laughs> so much back in the late 80s, early 90s. Like I, I watched the intro again for the first time, and I just had this massive amount 
of nostalgia for it. It's just crazy. And of course, Rhonda with her, you know, she had that same Elvira ditziness, but without the goth look. She had like more of like the peppy LA chick kind of like she was a stripper is what she kind of seemed like. But, you know, she was kind of that same ditzy character. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which I kind of enjoy. And I know that Elvira, I, I didn't really watch a lot of Elvira. She didn't come on in my, like when I was younger, I saw her on MTV. But I mean, she definitely was familiar with all these guys. I think that's, that looks like Joe Bob Briggs there in the front um, mm, on the, on the left. Yeah. Back when he was very young. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. And some of the classic hosts there as well alongside uh -huh. her in that shot where they all got together yeah For i didn't sure. see any of these now elvira was just southern california to begin with but then she was syndicated so she became unlike vampira she became a, a, a national figure but not international so none of these things traveled to the uk as far as i'm aware um yeah it was only really with the birth of uh, satellite television in the UK that we got sci the sci-fi channel. So my mm -hmm. brother and I, because he got a satellite TV because he was desperate for the sports, but we got the sci-fi channel and we suddenly we suddenly stumbled upon this thing called Mystery Science Theatre where these robots were making fun of really bad movies. We've never <laughs> seen... The whole genre was just mind-blowing to us, and this is in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so that's that was our first experience of it. My first experience of it here. Yeah, and it's so funny with Mystery Science Theater because they they started up much like a lot of these horror hosts at a local public access station. Yeah. Then they then they got picked up by the comedy uh, Comedy Central channel because like at that time there were all these cable channels that needed content to fill all of these programming slots that was cheap and quick to pull together. And so yeah. you see a lot of these types of shows as well as like crappy reruns of like bad movies. Like think about over here, we have channels called like TNT and USA who love to like buy lots of like really low rent movies and show them over and over and over. So a lot of us as kids watched some of these terrible movies like Tammy and the T-Rex over and over and over again <laughs> because some crappy station had bought them like as a cable network and had nothing else to show. So they every single Saturday they're showing the same movie. Um, but yeah, and then of course it moves, Mystery Science Theater ends up moving to the Sci-Fi Channel, which was a perfect place for them. But um, yeah, it's it's just really funny because I never really made that connection between like Rhonda Shear and Sandra Bernhardt's show and like Joe Bob Briggs to Mystery Science Theater, but they really are. It's the same thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a great genre. I mean, as a filler, it was just a great breeding ground <laughs> for amazing comedians at that time. Absolutely. And like I said before, I think that we we as a whole generation kind of owe a lot to these types of shows for exposing us to films we never would have seen otherwise. Um, because, you know, back in the day, I read this in the Vampire book, the whole concept of a B movie was these, the big studios back when the studio system was huge back in like the thirties, they would make these really high budget films with like big movie stars, but then they would also make, lower level cheaper movies and in order for a movie theater to get access to a really good movie they also had to agree to buy the crappy movie as well and show it so they would play these double features where they would play the really great movie and the really crappy movie and that's why it's called a b movie is because like the b side of a, of a single that gets released and yeah. so when the studio system kind of fell they didn't really function that same way but then you started getting these independent filmmakers because like the stuff to make movies with started getting affordable for like mid-tier people and so you know that's where you get like people like ed wood and then on and on and on like lots of b-movie people but 
all these movies are great. Like they're just, they're my favorite thing. I love them. And I never would have seen them if I hadn't come across these types of shows. So. Yeah. No, my brother and I spent many a, a late night. Uh, we used to have to pause it because we were, we were laughing so much. We couldn't breathe at some point. I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I did come across this thing. Um, I don't know if you remember this, Conrad, but I, I saw it was like something that happened on BBC Two. So in 1992, BBC Two aired this hosted horror movie show called The Vault of Horror. It was on Halloween night and it stayed on until the early hours of the morning. And they had Dr. Valpurgis. Now, I thought that was interesting because this is a callback to the movie Oubliette episode that you and I did on the movie Troll, mm. which uh, the, in the movie, all the events take place on Walpurgis night. Yes. And I just think it's kind of a weird, I love his uh, makeup and special effects mask thing that he's got going on. It's very, very creepy looking. So... It is, and it's a know. callback to our video essay on Legend because it looks very much like Rob Bottin's work from Legend. It does. It does. So yeah. I had never heard of this. Um, it's a, it's kind of hard. I think there are clips of it on uh, YouTube that you can go watch. So it's pretty oh. cool looking. Um, so that pretty much wraps up our uh, episode. So let's go and read a few super chats i think we've got just a couple so uh master sun thank you so much for he sent us two super chats i'll uh, read them both so he says i support this tomfoolery this topic is going to be a good one for the spooky season yes indeed and then he also notes that elvira introduced me to goth puberty and b movies in that order which i think is exactly what she was trying to do right <laughs> I think so. Yes, I think she knew exactly what she was doing. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, a lot of people note that Vampira is sort of the origin of goth, like the goth look and including the tie in with bondage, no pun intended, um, and the sort of leathery, you know, that whole aesthetic, it all kind of comes back to her and the way she styled it. But Elvira's take on it, I got to say, I'm not a fan of the big bouffant hair like that's the only thing about elvira that i've never been a big fan of like her dress is amazing like her mm. makeup is amazing like all of it is on point but the big bouffant beehive looking hairdo is a little much for me personally but you know yeah. i'm sure most people aren't looking at her hair so no, I, I think everybody is captivated by one particular thing. And I'm captivated because I want to know how it works. I don't know how do to stay that way. I just. So <laughs> I have done costumes that are when I was much younger, I did costumes that were cut like this. And it's it a lot of tape is involved. <laughs> oh, ow. That does not sound like fun. Yeah, they have like med I used medical tape, but you could they have like now they have boob tape that's like made for the dresses that are cut like this. Um, so you can kind of tape things in a certain way to keep them in place. There's got to be tape holding that in place and keeping the dress from like just moving and yeah. having a wardrobe malfunction, right? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And also, uh, I wanted to point out, King Eric says tassel spinning is an elective at Oxford. So that oh, yeah. must be why that you don't see that at Cambridge. It's just an Oxford yeah, thing. It's the other place. Yeah, we The don't rivalry continues. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the boat race, tassel spinning. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Master Sun says that Elvira is making fun of those 50s prudy housewives uh, with her mm. hair. I honestly think that she picked the big hair to offset the bigness of other things, but that's just my guess. I'm completely guessing on that. Makes so sense. I wanted to say before we wind down, and this is like really exciting to me. So our, our show for next month is we're going to, we're going to do something a little special. Um, we aren't going to tell you guys what it is, but it's something that you're not going to want to miss. We have like 
I'm really excited. We have this very special guest that we've been able to get and you're not going to believe it. It's super exciting. Um, we're, uh, it's going to be on the 18th of November. So it won't be the last Saturday of the month because that'll be like Thanksgiving weekend for Americans. And so we're doing it the weekend before that, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be really awesome. Um, our, what is our, title our show teaser word for next month conrad and so our teaser word is cuts mm, cuts looks cuts. like it's thanksgiving extravaganza yeah thanks thanksgiving not being something that you know anything about probably no so just like v vampira and elvira <laughs> this is going to be an education for me so i'm looking forward to it <laughs> yes, yes, I am too. Um, I I will say that it, it will probably be set up, just so you know, everyone, much more like a standard Retro Blasting Saturday live stream as well. So it's almost like a crossover from our Retro Blasting Saturday live stream with Dreamland with a special guest. So it's it's all the things for Thanksgiving. Like it'll be like an early Christmas present for everyone as well. So very yep. excited about that. So uh, we'll be posting this online. You guys can post your uh, guesses as to what our topic might be. Um, so uh, you can find our show notes with all of the links to all of our sources at retroblasting.com slash dreamland. Um, you can follow me and Conrad on Retroblasting and Movie Oubliette, respectively, on all social media outlets. And uh, you can email us at thedreamlandpodcast at gmail.com. So yes. thanks, everybody, so much for watching. Goodbye. Happy Halloween.